Whilst I'm bringing the next caller, I know that this is a, a topic which I um, said I was going to raise with you, uh, Phil, and it's one that I do with most of our guests. Um, tell us a little bit about your religious background, if any. Um, were you brought up religiously? Um, if you d were, did you at some stage lose that belief? Um, I'm just trying to adjust the contrast here. It's not going to get much better than this, I'm afraid. Um, yeah, so I was brought up in an intensely Catholic um, family. We uh, mass regularly. We had the rosary. If you don't know what the rosary is, it's five Our Fathers, um, uh, 50 Hail Marys in to total, five Glory Bees, and a whole range of different incantations after that. Um, so I had that from a very, very early age. Do you still remember them? Uh, uh, the, oh yeah, the Our Father, I can, that, that's embedded in my neurons. Our Father, art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, blah, 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 blah. So that, that I can ream off, um, it's, which is shocking, what a waste of neurons, um, and storage space. But um, yeah, that was uh, primary school, Catholic primary school, Catholic secondary school. Um, the story I told on 60 Symbols uh, a while ago um, was that in terms of where I, I, I can remember vividly kicking against religion throughout my childhood. Um, in fact, I, I pretty certain that there was a long time where I um, didn't believe in God, but I had a pretty strong faith in Santa Claus. Um, and this, the, the, at, at school, one of the, 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 the pivotal um, incidents was, um, I, I remember getting a microscope for Christmas. I, it was around nine or ten. I got very, very excited about this um, during a class because the class was about transubstantiation. And for those of you familiar with the Catholic faith, you know that it's about the conversion of the, the bread. Not quite literally, but it depends on which version of, of Catholic doctrine you read um, into the, the body of Christ. And as a nine year old, I got remarkably um, excited about this because I was going, we can finally definitively show this. We get the host before you do the whole malarkey with the, the, the Eucharist and the, the, the Holy Communion, and then we look at it afterwards. And then wouldn't that be a great experiment? They sent me out of the class and I was sent to the parish priest and I was told, you're not allowed, those are not the type of questions you should ask. So, um, yeah, and me and my religion didn't really get, get on from that point onwards. But, um, yeah, it's, um, it's depressing. I've, I've always found it depressing um, that so many... The, 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 the follow-up question, if I'm very quickly, um, obviously you're saying you were brought up uh, in a very strong Catholic uh, uh, upbringing. Um, when you drifted away from that, were there any repercussions? Because uh, obviously a lot of people um, who watch the show come from America, and I've heard so many accounts of uh, Americans who have lost friends and um, uh, contact with family as a result of yeah. losing their religion. Was there anything like that for you? Yes. So um, one of the um, the issues um, when I was living with uh, my girlfriend, which caused a great deal of... Um, uh, friction with um, my family um, was of course that we were seen to be living in sin and in fact it was said that um, we'd have been better off dead because if we uh, than living in sin because if we were dead at least we weren't damning our immortal souls that's that's pretty much a direct quote so that caused a lot of friction that friction's been um, mitigated no I wouldn't say mitigated it's just not something we speak about let's put it that way um, and there hasn't been pressure brought to bear um, with regard to religion um, because um, my family know that if, if any type of pressure, particularly with regard to my children, I'm trying to sort of uh, inculcate any type of Catholic sort of doctrine, they know that just in that case, my, my wife and I would, would sever ties. So um, perhaps I've been a bit more open there than I should have been. <laughs> All right, well, in that case, we'll move on. Concordance, I know, has a point. Concordance. Well, it, it triggered a, a memory. I was reading very recently a, a paper on the rosary and mm -hmm. the similarities when compared to uh, yogic, uh, or is it the, the yogic breathing, uh, yeah. transcendental meditation, that all of these things have the ability to have a physiological effect. Um, and that led me, be, <laughs> through my ADHD wikipedia um, 
to a lot of the other health effects and coping mechanisms that religion offers that non-religious people have to find some aspect in their lives. But the, the rosary has an effect on breath rhythm, and that lowers blood pressure for that period. Uh, there is a protective effect for young children that attend uh, religious services regularly, whether they consider religion important in their lives or not. If they're in church on Sundays or if they're going to whatever religious type ceremony, they are significantly less likely to use illicit drugs or to engage in um, high-risk behaviors. And that includes a whole uh, gamut of different things. So there, there's a certain question that needs to be raised among the non-religious, and that is, is this something that we want to be able to replicate, and, and is it a reasonable trade-off? Now, it says absolutely nothing about the truth value of religion, but maybe there is a health value. Maybe that's something that, that we want to think about um, providing alternatives to. That social network and the ritual aspect and something like meditation or breathing. Yeah. So, Sonia, we used to get all down on our knees. If I had any friends visiting or my brother or sister had any friends visiting, down on our knees, saying the rosary. Uh, yeah, you could argue that that 10 minutes of almost tranquility, for me, it, it was and would continue to be utter and completely mind-rotting boredom. But um, you, you could argue that that has important social um, or lends important social cohesion. I, I can certainly see that. And um, yeah, sometimes uh, there have been times in the past where to a certain extent, I've almost envied others in my family's um, faith in terms of the crutch-like element and, you know, getting them through the day. So, yes. Well, it's, 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 it's interesting. That it's, could you feel? The, the, real quick, the, the importance of the religion wasn't correlated with the, the health benefits and the uh, uh, illicit behaviors or the, the high-risk behavior prevention. It wasn't the importance of their religion. It wasn't how much they believed the words that were being said. It was just a matter of them showing up to the, the services. And the ritual, the routine. Yeah. The ritual of it. Can you get those benefits, I wonder, without the brimstone and hellfire and the fear and the psychological damage that comes along with that sometimes, are those part and parcel? I don't know. But it would be interesting. The, the, the data would suggest that it's simply a matter of community and ritual. Mm. I wanted to ask you if you could, uh, Phil, um, expand upon um, what you meant when you were jealous of the crutch. Uh, what exactly do you think that they benefit from by having that crutch that you're missing it's out on? Tran it's exactly what Concordance is saying, is that there's a tranquility there and a certainty there. And um, trained as a scientist, and I, I, this will be true, I'm pretty certain. In fact, if I'd gone on, my other option leaving school was possibly to go to a degree in English. I'm pretty certain that my mindset wouldn't be that much different. Um, but, you know, when you deal with uncertainty on a day-to-day -day basis, and it's such a part of your, of, of your life, sometimes you, it's, you know, to have, you can, you can look across, you can see um, on that, from that religious, uh, I don't know, cocoon, shelter, you can see uh, sometimes it does bring a peace of mind, delusional though that is, but it brings a peace of mind, and it perhaps is... Um, from that point of view, psychologically, again, agreeing with con concordance, just that, that absolute certainty, the ritual, the fact that you can descend into a, you know, an incantation, as it were, to sort of, um, I don't know, relieve the stress. You can, you can see how that might be a good thing at times, purely from a, oh, a relief point of view. Did that make any sense? Yes, it certainly did. Concordance wants to come back, and then we'll take the next uh, caller. Concordance. Yeah, you know, the other thing, especially here in the U.S., is religion is um, it's an in-group, out-group mechanic as well. And people are much more likely, if they know someone in their church that is, uh, let's say, a house painter, they're going to call that person long before they call someone who just is, is a name in the phone book. Uh, so I think in that way, even if you were completely irreligious. If, if you had no belief in it whatsoever, 
Um, you know, I, I go to church. This is not the reason why. I just think my kids ought to be familiarized with this stuff. But you could do it strictly as a business decision. I, you know, I go to the same country club. You could just as easily say, I go to the same Sunday morning uh, uh, brunch party or whatever, uh, that there are economic and health-related uh, consequences of going to these services and sort of participating in that community. Now, you could just as easily join a secular group that might have a lot of the same connotations. But we're talking about a building on every corner here in Texas uh, with a different group uh, that you belong to that, that, that give you special favoritism. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's interesting the tribal nature of it because, you know, we'd like to think, I guess, as you know, rational beings searching for the truth or whatever, that um, we'd be above that. But you know, that tribal nature is not just a f you know part or a parameter or a you know a characteristic of the religious. You can see that sort of tribal nature and that need to group with like-minded individuals um, uh, everywhere. <laughs> Well, and it could be even like a sports team. You know, the the the, the Mankeys all get together, the Manchester fans all uh, support each other. And, you know, I, I know that guy, he's wearing my team's colors. I, mm. I don't think it's all that different. Um, yeah. You know, so he's a, a good Catholic, I can tell. So, uh, so I'm a big the fan. ultimate. Heavy um, rock. Hard. And for me, it's music. When it comes to tribe, it's the, there's, a, there's a big tribal element in, in hard rock and heavy metal and thrash metal and Where's death Aaron metal. Rock? So it's <laughs> Sorry? Aaron Rock should be here. He looks like a friggin' roadie for uh, Motorhead. <laughs> Indeed, yes. Uh, Thunderfoot, and then we'll take uh, Shandred, who's been waiting very patiently for us. Thunder, then the next caller. Uh, military. I mean, that's the ultimate sort of where you belong, the place where you belong, where it's difficult to conceive that there's going to be a, a stronger bonding than you're going to get uh, where you actually have to really trust your life to these people. But I mean, I think you get the same sort of benefit uh, if you're young kids and you, you are strongly bound in a group, there are... Um, uh, feelings of emotional security that, or, or feelings of security that come from that, which may well have you know, tangible health benefits. Okay, on that note, I insist that we're going to take the next caller, because as I say, he's been waiting very patiently. Welcome to the show. Hello there, can you hear me? Very well. Yeah. How are you, sir? Uh, very fine, thank you. Um, th this is uh, actually not the topic yet, but just to bring an information that Concordance didn't quite have here. Uh, the name of the rel relativistic game is uh, a slower speed of light. Uh, and you can get it freely from the MIT. As I say, we'll include that in the link in the description to the videos when they're posted on YouTube. Thank you very much for That's that. Great. I'll certainly okay. disseminate that link amongst the students at Nottingham. I'll, I'll post uh, it to you in an email, uh, Phil. That's great. Thank you. All right, uh, what I wanted to talk about is this um, article that I ran into this week called uh, um, Scientific Fraud is Rife. It's time to stand up for good science. It's in The, um, in the Guardian, I think. And, and uh, uh, they're, what, they're what does it say? Give us the gist of what it says. Um, it, it says a, a number of things, but basically it says that the metrics for, that we currently use to say like what's a good scientific contribution are just completely broken at the moment. Um, that uh, we're valuing too much the number of publications rather than the quality of such publications and, uh, and uh, Maybe too many publications are getting away with giving not enough data for you to replicate the. Well, the I mean, th th this I think is a, as sort of always has been a universal problem: is how do you actually determine what is valuable research? In that things that might seem obscure and, and eclectic um, can become the core of you know whole fields of, of future research, um, and. It, as, as broad brush metrics, 
publications and citations are not bad. He, he compares it to everything else, but they also have significant limitations to them. Um, yeah, may, maybe the most obvious example of this would be the Fullerenes, which was Crota and someone else's Nobel Prize. Smalley. So, sorry? Smalley, Richard Smalley. Smalley. Okay. Um, but, you know, the guy was working on polycarbon uh, compounds in deep space. And, of course, you'd expect the stuff gets virtually no citations. And from this comes fullerene. Uh, it, it's very difficult to know um, how the unknown is going to unfold before you. Okay, so there's a big, big issue. I'm delighted this has been brought up because we are approaching in the UK something called the Research Excellence Framework um, Census Date, which is where we submit our four best papers. And um, those four best papers are then looked let, at... Let, let, let me just interrupt briefly. With a name like that, it's got pointless bureaucracy written all over it. Oh, it has. It absolutely has. So um, anything with excellence in it. Basically, if you want to trace out bullshit, just look for the word excellence. You know, that's it. You know, every... every much, much, much like if you want to find something that is undemocratic, look for democratic in the name of the country. Indeed. Indeed. No, the excellence thing is great because every single bloody mission statement of every university and every university department is, we are going to strive for excellence. What else are you going to strive for? Mediocrity. It's just fucking ridiculous. Um, sorry. Striving so, to be subnormal. Yeah, exactly. Striving to be just competent. Um, Striving to be average. Yeah, indeed. Uh, so we're coming up to this, and, and the, the question is, how do you rank those papers? It's a huge issue, not just in terms of, of science, but in the UK, it makes um, uh, the, it has a direct financial impact because how those papers are ranked determines the ranking of a physics department or any department, any scientific department or any department in any university. And that in turn de determines how much money they get from the university. One thing we have now is something called the H index. So if you've published 20 papers and each one of those have received at least 20 citations, then you've got a H index of 20, etc. You know, you, you, if you've got 40 papers each having at least 40, then you've got a H index of 40. But everything is quantitative. Everything is, we are trying, we are constrained by bibliometrics in terms of, is this a good quality paper? And it's so depressing because now instead of reading that paper, the first thing we do is we dive to something like Web of Knowledge or Google Scholar or whatever. How many citations has it got? And that's used as a proxy for the quality of that paper. And that, of course, drives short-termism, drives out the type of, you know, um, at the fringes, science, which sometimes leads to the, the most important innovations, as, as Thunder was saying. Um, so that's a major issue. But I thought from the, at the start that what, the, what Shundred was saying was that there was an issue with fraudulent research, which is an entirely different aspect uh, of this. Yeah, actually, I didn't uh, have time to properly uh, pose the detail that the article talks about. You have that, that time uh, now. Hit us. <laughs> the um, detail about the fraud here that they say is that uh, there seems to be a very strong bias uh, towards accepting positive results rather than null results. And uh, this ends up encouraging the researchers to basically fudge their data. Or, or yeah. there's even a more systematic effect, which is that negative results are rarely published, which means that we overestimate. If we have a statistical sampling and we throw away all the, the low values, then we end up with a number that's not the true mean. It's not the, it's not the true average. And that, that's a factor that you can even test statistically, right? If you've got a distribution that appears to be skewing way too far to the right, um, or, or it's sort of lopsided when you when you graph out the the papers versus the results. That's an indication that there's a significant what's called the file drawer effect, um, where where negative papers are simply not published. Um, 
there are so many journals now. There, there are more journals. Can I, can I just talk about that for a moment? Because this is something that sure. um, I, I um, was looking back on uh, only a couple of days ago, which is the um, paper, <coughs> excuse me, that was published um, by the or a number of those that believe that 9/11 was an inside job, um, including the likes of Professor. Stephen Jones and architect Richard Gage, and they wrote this paper um, in which they purported to have found um, unreacted thermite in the uh, dust of um, 9-11, thereby uncovering potentially the greatest conspiracy the world has ever seen. And they went to a journal called the Bentham Journal of oh, Chemistry and something, uh, which is a paid for, you pay to have the paper published. Any respectable scientist would never go near such a paper, and in fact, the editor of that journal um, resigned as a result of that paper being published in the journal. But there is something, so you've got to be cautious about it, um, journals, but I think there is something called the impact um, <laughs> index or something. Impact factor, yeah, which it is, is sure. right. yeah, is, is a measure of how um, regularly papers in that particular journal are cited. I groaned when I heard the Bantam, the Bantam, um, name because any scientist, I think, any professional scientist probably gets bombarded from that company at least um, at least weekly, possibly daily, by invitations to act as an editor or invitations to, to review a paper. And it's well, this, this particular job. journal that they, these 9-11 people published in uh, had, I think, um, 90 editors and four papers published in one year. <laughs> Wonderful. It's very important to get those editorships on board. It really boosts your CV. You know, you're looking for promotion. <laughs> wow, that's remarkable. Yeah, the, the impact factor is, uh, is another issue. I think, uh, is it nature uh, that's got like the highest? Nature is always yeah. the highest. Yeah, yeah but the is usually number two. There's a, there's a brilliant, um, sorry, I will shut up and let others get some info. But, um, no, you're our special guest. This is what we asked you on for. Too. Okay, you, you're going to regret it. Yeah, sure. Um, so um, there was an article, oh no, no, a blog post by a guy called Stephen Curry. It's worth, very worthwhile Googling this, um, called I'm Sick of Impact Factors and So Is Science. Um, if you look at, he talks about using impact factors as being statistically illiterate, which is exactly what it is, because although nature has the highest impact factor, if you actually look at the distribution in terms of the number of citations, the reason it has that high impact factor is that the vast majority are getting ones and twos, but you've got those couple of kill, sorry, I'm moving out of shot, those couple of killer papers, which are picking up hundreds and hundreds of citations. And those are skewing. And of course, if you just look at the mean value, you lose all the data on the distribution. So impact factor is a statistically dodgy measure to use. Um, on the other hand, nature is clearly a very good journal. Science is clearly a very good journal. I mean, that's Sorry, where Rich, people uh, put the uh, earth earth shattering. If I may, I will, the caller um, has messaged that he's got another point that he wants to come back on, so we'll take him first and then you can call him. Sean Rick, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, I'm not sure if this was in the article or whether I, this information came to me uh, through a conversation with somebody else, but uh, it, it seems that um, there is a suggestion that maybe researchers should publish beforehand their hypothesis before actually doing the research and publishing the results. Philip? Oh, yeah. I'll do so it's interesting because it seems to be in the biomedicals. Concordance can probably um, uh, answer this better than I can. But in the biomedical sciences, there's a real drive towards you've got to have your hypothesis nailed down and then you pursue that hypothesis. And if you don't do that, then you're not going to get your grant funded. It's not quite like that in the physical sciences and physics and chemistry, um, whereby you have some broad objectives or you some broad aims, but they're a lot greyer at the edges and you're allowed to, to move around. Um, I think the more important point in terms of Shundred is, is, is A, not relying on the impact factor. We've got to read 
the papers. Professional scientists have got to read the papers and judge on the basis of the quality of the, you know, the, the data that's in front of them instead of being lazy and relying on impact factor. And still, that's, again, not going to address the, the problem of, of, you know, fraudulent data that, that is increasing in the literature. Um, concordance, um, you mentioned some time ago pharmaceutical companies. If there's any particular group of researchers who um, are guilty of skewing data to remove negative results, it's big pharma. And um, there's somebody called Ben Goldacre in the UK who's, um, I don't know, Richard, you may, may, may well have heard of him, who's written a number of books on um, just how dangerous this is. Concordance. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Ben Goldacre. Um, I, I, I think in, to some extent that's, that's a very fair criticism that, that there is some skewing. I will say, in, specifically to address Chandra's question, that any clinical trial that is engaged, that is that is started, is registered in the U.S. at least in clinicaltrials.gov, and that is published in advance what their populations will be, what their guidelines will be, what effects they'll be measuring, what their endpoints are, so that anyone can see in advance what they were attempting. Um, but, of course, all of this was put in place because of the allegations of data biasing by the pharmaceutical industry. We, we, we've talked about, I say we as a community, have talked about these sort of open lab consortiums where people will pre-register their studies and their study designs uh, in advance of doing them. The reason why it doesn't get a lot of momentum is science is a very competitive field. If you disclose what your projects are, you have competitors. Uh, you can imagine Microsoft uh, announcing their business plan or their marketing plans. Uh, all their competitors would, would be all over it. It would be like uh, announcing your next six moves in chess. Uh, so th there's, there's a need for a certain amount of secrecy. Uh, unfortunately, th those two things are in tension. You have this sort of file drawer effect, this, this uh, negative publishing bias. Uh, and then you have this sort of open and transparent research world. Th there needs to be some compromise reached, I think, so that people are more accountable. There have also been some moves, at least in my field. Well, let me, let me say real quickly, my field has been transformed uh, by technology in the last five years. What, what was the Human Genome Project, you know, a 10-year, multi-billion dollar project, can now be done in an afternoon with an instrument that you could uh, fit in the back of a Volvo, right? So something that was a, a moonshot type project can now be done routinely in the space of an afternoon. And that was, that was only 10, 15, 20 years mm -hmm. ago that, that the scale of that has changed. So sequencing technology has moved very, very fast. And along with that, this sort of approach of looking at the entire genome as a whole, as a, as a, as a gestalt, as a, uh, a single thing to be mined for data, people are, are dumping the results of these massive big science projects into papers without a lot of scrutiny on their own part or on the part of reviewers of what the legitimacy is of those results. It's very easy to generate, uh, let's say, 400 hits uh, that, that show some sort of interesting correlation with cancer or diabetes, whatever it may be. But there has to be more, uh, a stricter guideline to keep that kind of junk out of the literature. And because of the proliferation of journals, it's much easier now to get even crap data published. And, and I think that's a growing problem. Now, so one of the things that, that I was um, uh, mentioning in comments here on Skype is the number of retractions has taken off. In my field in particular, psychology, molecular biology, um, and a lot of the more results-oriented research projects, the number of retractions has gone from, in 2001, it was about 22 papers uh, in Medline Index Journal. So 22 papers were retracted in 2001. There were 360 retracted in 2011. That's 360 papers, and a lot of them were retracted. You have uh, 10 or 15 papers retracted, all authored by the same 
by the same author, either reusing his data in multiple places. About 27% of those results, though, were the result of fraud. And the fraud is rarely to vi uh, vilify or vindicate some new drug. It's, it's not the result of uh, pharmaceutical companies sending out their, their men in black agents or uh, offering suitcases of cash. It's just some dumb grad student wanted to get his PhD and get the hell out of there. And so he takes Photoshop and he moves this little white band up a little bit higher on the, on the picture. You know, it's, it's that kind of just sort of sloppy research. There's too much of it in going into too many different journals for there to be adequate oversight of each, each outcome. And this all ties back into our initial topic. And I, I sounded like I was really advocating for these big science projects. The nice thing about big science is they tend to have big impacts, but there's an, not as so many of them that we can't have some oversight, that they can't cross-validate each other. When you have 10,000 labs all working on the same or similar projects, there's just not enough time to give oversight to all those projects to really pick apart all the data. And so you get these 360 retractions um, where a few years ago that would have been unheard of. You know, people and what's, would have been what's shocked. interesting is how many slip through the process. Um, I, I'm acutely aware of the Actually, time. I, I'm going to go back. I, well, Thunder, then I'm going to, I want to go back to um, uh, to for him to explain what he's just actually typed into Skype. Thunder, then uh, Shandred, and then I, I have to move on to the next caller. Yeah, I mean, fundamentally what the literature is, is there for is it's for people who require new information. There needs to be screened and people need to be able to access it. Now, the thing is that this all grew up in essentially the days of the printing press. Um, and there's a lot of inertia that goes with it, you know, both in the actual sort of essentially knowledge industry itself. That's the people who run the literature and, and the scientists, you know. They have a way of doing things. There's a lot of people who do it that way. So there's a lot of inertia to change these things. Um, but ultimately, I, I think the digital media is, is going to change everything. Um, I'm not sure that this uh, form of peer review literature has a long-term future. Um, I, I see it actually moving over to something a lot more dynamic and integrated. But Shandred, I'm so, I'm so sorry. I am going to insist that we move on because we're running out of time and I do want to get the next caller in because I think this could be quite interesting. 